So, you've been told that I'm a boat builder. That's true, but I'm not going to talk to you about boat building tonight. I'm going to talk to you about storytelling. I told my first story when I was six years old, at least the first story I recall telling. I told my classmates that my father was an airline pilot. He wasn't. <laughs> 20 minutes later, I corrected the record. I told them he was a bricklayer. Guess what? He wasn't. Three years later in the playground, I denied being a Mennonite. It was silly because in the town where I grew up, everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew that I was a Mennonite. But Mennonites were low in the pecking order, and I didn't want to be teased. So it made total and complete sense to my little mind to deny an essential part of who I was. Years later, I made up an entirely different fictional me. During my first year at college, I told people that I came from Vancouver instead of the Fraser Valley, that I sailed, I didn't. I created new career for my folks and better vacations, a better school, and interestingly enough, I made myself an Anglican. If truth be told, I don't recall most of what I made up. It was a long time ago and embarrassing enough that I've managed to repress it like a good Mennonite, I might add. How many of you know Mennonites? <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. The episode didn't end well. As any of you know who have made up stories about yourself, nothing good comes of it. In my case, I met somebody who I cared about, fessed up, and the storytelling came to an end. Partly out of guilt, partly out of embarrassment, and to a certain degree curiosity, I went to see a therapist. He and I talked, and he asked, did I feel shame? Mm, like a Mennonite, yes. I was ashamed, embarrassment, oh yes. Was I sorry? Yes. I had hurt people, of course I was sorry. But, but... Here's the thing, I liked telling stories. When I told the therapist this, he told me something that I thought was very wise. He said, we're all telling stories. It's up to each of us to decide whose story we're going to tell. Keep that in mind, whose story we're going to tell. Then he suggested acting or writing. Anyway, that was 1985. Who am I today? That's me, but that was two years ago. Today, I'm the proprietor of Ashes Stillwater Boats, a small company that designs and builds wooden canoes and kayaks. The company was premised on this statement. The fragments from one's past would be crafted into something unique, not at all like the original, but evoking it in its complete essence. I would capture and transform things on their way to being lost. Memory and artifact would be forged into a new form of narrative. What that meant was we'd build stuff from cool things, precious objects in people's lives, a canoe, for instance, from wood recovered during a cottage demolition or gunnels from grandma's chair. And for the most part, we've been successful. Since having started the company in 2014, we've built boats for customers in Canada and the United States, and we've distributed plans to roughly 1,000 builders in 30-odd countries. For the last two years, our shop has been located in a century-old barn with a rubblestone courtyard and big sliding Doors. It's a rural paradise where it's just as easy to lose an afternoon listening to the birds and the breezes as it is to pick up the tools. I wouldn't say I've arrived, but I do feel like I'm on my way. So, what happened between 1985 and 2014? Well, I took that therapist's advice. I graduated with a fine arts degree in creative writing. I wrote some plays. I wrote some scripts and treatments, published some fiction, did a gig writing features for an entertainment magazine. I had three kids, founded Quirk Notes, made no money, got divorced, got married, and eventually ended up making ends meet doing communications management gigs. By the time 2014 hit, I was working with a local animal shelter managing their capital campaign. It was the end of a bunch of contracts that were all kind of weird in their own way, and I ended up spending most of our vacation that summer working and complaining to anybody who would listen. My wife, mostly. We were staying way out on this amazing point of land in Nova Scotia. But I was cranky, unmotivated, and very unhappy. I didn't like who I was, where I was, or what I was doing. But there was one thing, one thing that animated me. Out there, there was a retired guy next door, and he loved boats. Building boats, sailing boats, designing boats, anything about boats, you name it, he loved it. And I loved talking to him about it. 
So picture this. Ten days into our trip, mid-rant, my wife stops me with one of those "Uh uh-oh looks and says, so Trev, all you do is bitch about work and talk about boats. When the, she didn't say, "Mm -mm." are you going to do something about that? And that was the genesis of Ash's Stillwater Boats. By November of the following year, I'd prototyped our first boat, rented a shop, and had enough orders to justify not taking another communications gig. Two years later, business was steady, and I had a full-time apprentice from the local school and a retired fellow carving paddles, keeping me company. I had a kick-ass shop. I was an artisan with a beard to prove it. (laughs) And I was still telling stories. The paddles in this picture were made from honey locusts and cherry. The cherry was harvested in the 1950s from the customer's family homestead. The honey locust started as skis made by his great-grandfather in 1910. This canoe was made of cedar recovered from the Avon stage retrofit in the 1980s. This boat is made from cedar, two cedar fence posts, and it weighs 30 pounds. I was doing what I had set out to do. I was designing and building boats. Pretty cool, right? Desk guy gets fed up, starts a boat company, whiles away the hours in the shop happily ever after. You knew there'd be a twist. Nope. In the summer of 2016, I was at an outdoor show surrounded by curious people, all of whom were saying wonderfully affirming things about my boats. But I was irritated by it, by them. And to be truthful, I was more than irritated. I was angry. And I had no clue why. I just knew that something wasn't right. Something wasn't clicking. I was tired. I was cranky. I wasn't motivated. In fact, I found myself pretty much back in the same place I was during that vacation in Nova Scotia. The long and short of it was that a few weeks later, I was diagnosed with depression. When I told my wife about the diagnosis, she gave me a puzzled look and said, I don't get it. You're finally doing something you love. Right. And there you have it. There's the rub. How does a guy who's dreamed of being a creator all of his life and is on the cusp of making it real all of a sudden not give a damn? I designed and built that and that. Famous people were following me on Instagram. It's true. And I was entirely unimpressed. I'd finally found my bliss and I could have cared less. Right. So what changed? Why am I here? Why did I fly from Sao Paulo to get here if I didn't care? Well, after getting the diagnosis, I sat down in that beautiful stone courtyard. I listened to the birds and stared a long, long time at the trees. I stopped building and I started thinking. I started thinking about the boats I designed and built. And I started thinking about what made them worth building. Remember that quote at the beginning? I would, tra- I would capture and transform things on their way to being lost. Memory and artifact would be forged into a new form of narrative. I kept thinking about that. The more I thought about it, the less comfortable I was with it. As a guiding principle, it was fantastic. But in practice, it wasn't working. Why? Because I wasn't using it as a guiding principle at all. It was clever copywriting. Marketing shtick. The very thing I'd started Ashes to escape. I wasn't forming a new type of narrative at all. I I was telling a pretty story to sell boats. So, okay, yeah, using recovered materials was part of the story, but it was far from the whole story. It didn't include the part where I was kept up at night because of anxiety about delivery dates or about money, the part where perfectionism stalled me for days or that every boat had its flaws. The whole story included the fact that my days were actually not that pleasant. Sawdust in your sinuses 24-7 sucks. Earplugs eight hours a day sucks. When people told me I was lucky to be doing something I loved, that my boats were too beautiful to put in the water, that bugged me because even though I liked what I was selling, I actually didn't like what I was doing, which sucks. Here I was trying to tell an authentic story, and what I was doing was telling a beautifully curated marketing myth. 
All those things that kept me up at night, the anxiety about delivery dates, imperfect joins, the fingerprints in the varnish, all those things were part of each boat, but they weren't part of the story. At the same time I was doing a lot of sketching, I had always been cognizant of a boat's relationship to nature and anatomy in particular, but now I was making it explicit. Look, those ribs that you see there on the left, those are human ribs, and look at how they replicate there the hull of a canoe. And on the same side over here, that's a seal. Here, we have seed pods. And you can see part of the history of this is that those seeds bring life. The wind catches and carries them across continents, from one place to another, they take life from A to B. Well, that's what boats did. How did all of us get here on this continent? Unless we were born here uh, thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, we came by a boat. All of us came here at one time or another by this form of transportation. Here we have bones. You'll see over here this paddle. That's a human foot and that's a canoe paddle. And if you look carefully, you can see here the very feminine lines of a canoe, and here we have the somewhat masculine lines of a kayak. If you look at it the right way, the anatomy of a boat has this incredible relationship to our own anatomies. When looked at this way, it's easy to see that a canoe is more than just a thing that you sit in and paddle or hang on the wall. And as I explored that, the boat started to feel less like physical objects made of materials with provenance and more like objects integrated into who we are as humans, both historically and physically. The drawings told me that I was involved in a story that stretched deep into our collective psyches. And if you visit our website today, you'll see imagery that connects the boats to the anatomy of various mammals, birds, and fish. At some point in this exploration, I recognized that I'd stopped feeling resentful. What people were telling me when they said that the boats were beautiful was that they found something in their own relationship to themselves and to nature that they found beautiful. When you respond to something in these boats, you are responding to something somewhere inside you that connects you to their form. It's a something that exists, that exists at a deeply personal level and doesn't require the affirmation of others. I don't need you to tell me that they're beautiful and you don't need me to tell you or affirm your opinion of them. Anyway, out of all of that came the idea that I didn't need to build boats to be content. What I needed to do was find the thing, the real story, if you must, behind the boats. I came to understand that the story wasn't the boat. The story was everything that resulted in the boat. I realized that I didn't need to hide the flaws. I realized, or I could admit, that they weren't perfect. I could point out the thumbprint in the varnish, if you will. And those things that had stalled me, deadlines, perfectionism, money, uncertainties about materials or design, they mattered less. Since then, I've made fewer boats and designed more. I've worked with a sculptor on public art projects. And just this week, I was meeting with educators in Brazil on a project that brings together technology, boats, and social innovation. I still build and design beautiful boats, and don't get me wrong, I still want them to be beautiful. And I do care that all of you think that they are beautiful. The difference is I don't need them to be beautiful. In fact, it would be awfully boring if that's all that they were. If my boats are a story, and I believe that they're a story, they're a story that includes the good and the bad, all the inputs and all the outputs. They are marketing shtick. They are much, much more than the images curated for our social feeds. They are a story that includes the good, the bad, the boring, the exciting, the flaws, the successes, the fingerprints and the varnish, the anxieties about deadlines, the uneven shear lines, the spilled epoxy, a story that includes the flaws you see and the flaws that you don't. Your story is not what you post on Snapchat or Instagram, it's every decision that you make every day, everything that happens to you and everything that you make happen, the beautiful and the banal. In the end, it doesn't matter who you are, a student, a medical intern, or a boat builder. What you did today, what you had for breakfast, the missed bus connection, the cranky roommate, the fact that you denied being a Mennonite, 
the skin knuckles and the sawdust in your sinuses. Even as you sit here tonight, you are telling a story. You have no choice. Remember that therapist I told you about at the beginning? He was wrong. We don't get to choose whose story we tell. We only get to tell our own. And since you're telling a story, make it good. Thank you.